First of all, let me say thank you to all you guys for coming today. My name is uh, Matt Stokes. I'm the uh, Associate Director of Proteomics at Cell Signaling Technology. And today my colleague Chris Manning and I are going to tell you guys a little bit about mechanisms of immune regulation in cancer and specifically looking at phosphorylation through mass spec-based proteomics and flow cytometry. So a little bit about CST first. So we were founded in 1999. And since then, we've been developing, manufacturing, and validating all our antibodies in our Massachusetts facility. Uh, we've been doing flow with our antibodies since 2002. Then in 2003, we came up with a way to use some of our antibodies in combination with mass spec to look at post-translationally modified peptides. We're an environmentally focused company. Uh, both of our buildings are LEED certified. We are community-centered, trying to be active in our community and have been named a top charitable contributor. Uh, but the big thing about CST is that we're really a quality-driven company, right? We pride ourselves on the quality of our reagents, the quality of our technical support, and the quality of our customer experience. It's really important to us, as we are a company of scientists for scientists. So in my group, in the world of proteomics, we do a few different things. So we do service projects where people send us in samples and they can send in cell lines, tissues, We've done plant material, whole organisms, uh, microbial samples, sorted cells, even serum or plasma. We put that through our processes and come back with a nice finished data package, right, where we tell people here's what we identified quantitatively, here's what we see going up and going down between samples, between conditions, guides to walk you through those tables, read and interpret the data, how to prioritize candidates, and then for each project that we do, once we've delivered the data and you've had some time to kind of review it and see that everything makes sense, we have a follow-up consultation. We go through the data together, answer any questions, make sure everything's clear. And we really try and stick with our clients through the whole process of understanding the data to then validating the data, even through to publication. And there are really kind of three main categories that we work in when we do these services. So we do total proteomics. So here we're looking at unmodified peptides to tell us what's happening to protein levels across samples. And here we're working in the kind of microgram quantities of protein per sample. We do PTM proteomics. So here we're doing identification and quantification of thousands of sites of post-translational modification. And in a couple of slides we'll see all the different PTMs we can assay using this technology. And here, it kind of depends on the enrichment, but we're in the kind of milligrams down to micrograms quantities of protein, depending on which PTM you want to look at. And then we do targeted assays, or IPRM proteomics. And here you have a fixed list of proteins or proteins and sites that you want to look at. And you assay that fixed list across a lot of different samples. And again, here, it depends on your endpoints, but our goal is typically down, to be down into the micrograms of, of protein per, uh, per sample. So also in the group, we have uh, support for our kits. So the same reagents we use to do those services, we also offer as kits. If you have access to a mass spec, you can do the enrichments yourself, run the data in your own lab, and get the same kind of results we're generating with our services. So as an antibody company, it really, of course, always starts with the antibodies for us. And typically, when we develop an antibody, we use a single peptide as the antigen. Here I'm showing a phosphopeptide. So we raise antibodies against that one peptide, purify, validate, and get something that's really nice and specific for that one protein site. Well, the antibodies we use for the mass spec are a little bit different. So instead of using a single sequence as the antigen, we actually use degenerate peptide libraries. So again here I'm showing a phosphopeptide, a phosphoserine, and there's an arginine at minus three. So every peptide in that library has those two residues fixed, and then we vary all the other amino acids around it. We raise antibodies against that library of peptides, and what we get when we do that are antibodies that are really exquisitely specific for that targeted motif, that RXX phospho S. But they'll react broadly with a lot of different primary amino acid sequences. So we can do this for phospho motifs. We can also do this for other PTMs like acetylation of lysine, again, using that degenerate peptide library-based approach. We then use these in what we call the PTM scan method. So we start with any of those biological materials we were talking about before. And one of the first things we do is digest to peptides. So we're doing peptide level analysis here, not analysis of proteins or protein complexes. We'll then take those peptides, enrich with one of these specialized motif or PTM antibodies, run our mass spec, 
identify the peptides, and then do our quantification to tell us what's up and what's down between samples. And so using this technology, we can now look at all of these different PTMs, phosphorylation, ubiquitination, acetylation, other lysine, acyl modifications. And today I'm really going to focus in on the phosphorylation part of the story. So in the phospho space, we have all these different motif antibodies available. And you'll see the top row there is a phosphotyrosine. And then we have this whole slew of phosphoserine threonine motif antibodies. And these can be used singly. They can be used in combination. A question we get a lot, though, is, all right, well, you have one for tyrosine. Why not just have one for serine, one for threonine, and be done with it? And there's a couple reasons why we did it this way. One, it's really hard to get a completely context-independent phosphoserine or phosphothreonine motif antibody. Whenever we test out single clones when we do this, we always see some secondary preference for another amino acid around that phosphorylation site. And the second, and I think maybe more important reason that we do this, is there's so much serine and threonine phosphorylation in a given cell or tissue that you really can't assay it all with a single mass spec run. It's just too much of it. And so this kind of strategy, where we, what we've done is basically tried to pull out substrates of the various kinases around this kinome tree it allows us to really get kind of depth of coverage and get down to lower abundance proteins or lower stoichiometry sites of phosphorylation. So kind of three main methods we use to do phosphoanalysis in the lab. One, we just talked about the PTM and the motif antibodies. But we can also do a more general enrichment. So this is called IMAC, a mobilized metal affinity chromatography. And here, instead of using an antibody to enrich, we're actually using an iron ion on beads. The iron will interact with the negatively charged phosphates and pull down, in principle, basically any phosphorylated peptide. It's a great as a kind of a broad survey tool because it'll pull down anything that's phosphorylated. But you know, an interesting thing that we found and others have found this as well is that depending on how you enrich, you actually see different pools of phosphopeptides identified. So this Venn diagram just shows the number of unique phosphopeptides we see from the IMAC enrichment in the middle and then some of our different antibody enrichments around the outside. As you can see, the IMAC circle is the biggest, right? We get the most data out of IMAC. But what you can also see is that the overlap between the IMAC and these other enrichments is really pretty small. And to me, I think it's really most critical for the one at the top there, phosphotyrosine. So because IMAC will pull down any phosphopeptide, it tends to be more abundance driven right? You tend to see the more abundant sites first. Well, phosphotyrosine is only around, you know, 1% of phosphorylation in a given cell or tissue. And so you end up missing a lot of that data if you're just doing an IMAC enrichment. You really need that antibody enrichment in order to get depth of coverage. So there's motif antibodies, there's IMAC. We have a third way that we look at phosphorylation, and that's a pathway-based approach. So here are the methods exactly the same. We cut to peptides, enrich with an antibody, and run mass spec. The only difference are the antibodies that we're using. So here, instead of one of those specialized motif or PTM antibodies, we're actually using multiplex cocktails of our site-specific antibodies, so our catalog products. And we've put these together so that in one enrichment, we can read out activation status of a whole signaling pathway or a protein type like a kinases. So we've made a bunch of these over the years, but the most popular by far has been our multi-pathway enrichment. And for this one, what we did was we looked at all these different signaling pathways. And we said, all right, what are the core critical signaling regulators of all these different pathways? And let's make one tool, one enrichment reagent, that'll cover activity status across all of these different signaling spaces. This pie chart just shows the relative contribution by protein type of the things we're pulling out with this enrichment. And it's pretty small, but the biggest piece of the pie there in the top right, the blue, are kinases. About 30% of the data we're getting out are peptides from kinases. It makes sense given that kinase activity is driving a lot of these different signaling pathways, right? And this reagent has been validated in human and mouse. We've actually tried it in a bunch of other species and it works pretty well, I think, because of the level of conservation you have around these critical sites of phosphorylation. But overall, from this one enrichment, we can get out about 4,000 sites of phosphorylation on about 800 different proteins. And again, this is all focused on proteins for which we know the function, sites for which we understand the function, they're activating, they're inhibiting, they change localization, those kind of things. And the, the full list of what we can see with this tool is available online. So three different ways to enrich with, I think, kind of three different goals. So the first one, the motif antibodies, is great for depth of coverage. 
right? You're looking in a more confined space, but you're able to dig down deep to some of those lower abundance proteins or low stoichiometry sites. The iMac enrichment's great for breadth of coverage, right? So it's one enrichment, goes very broad. If you wanted to do just one, have one way to look at things, one single enrichment, and read out as much data as possible, then the iMac is a good choice. And then there's the pathway-based enrichment, which I think of as more of a, a targeted coverage. Not, not targeted in the sense of how the mass spec is operating, but targeted in the sense of this is a fixed list of endpoints that we're going to look at in all the samples. So we tested out these three different methods in a pretty simple experimental system. We took some jerkats, untreated or treated with anti-CD3 antibody, digested peptides, and then did these three different enrichments, the multi-pathway, phosphotyrosine for a motif for PTM antibody, and then IMAC. And these were all done in parallel, done separately. We then run the mass spec, get our peptide IDs, and then do our quantification to say how much of each peptide is present in each sample. So what did we see? Well, first qualitatively, this is another Venn diagram just showing the number of unique phosphopeptides identified with the three different approaches. And again, as we saw before, the IMAC is the biggest circle, right? We identify the most phosphopeptides with IMAC. But the other thing you can really see here is how little overlap there is between the three enrichment methods. In fact, 99% of the phosphopeptides we identify were only identified in one of the three enrichments. Okay, so these are really complementary enrichment tools. And in order to really cover a pathway, you kind of need to do all three. Now, in this case, we're most interested in TCR signaling. So this is our T-cell receptor signaling pathway. And the things we light up in yellow here, we can see phosphopeptides from using at least one of these enrichments. So really great coverage of the pathway. We've got about 85% coverage of the pathway, and for a lot of these proteins, we're actually seeing multiple phosphorylation sites. So how about some specific examples? Here we're looking at the ERKs. So activation loop site phosphorylation of ERK1, ERK2. And as you can see here, we're getting these peptides kind of no matter how you enrich. We see it with multipathway PY and IMAC. The only difference is in the multipathway, we can see unmodified peptides from ERK to look at what's happening to ERK protein levels. Okay, so in this case, it doesn't really matter. You're going to get that data out whether you do an IMAC enrichment or an antibody enrichment. But how about some other examples? Well, here's mTOR. So for mTOR, we get a couple of sites with the IMAC, nothing with phosphotyrosine, and that's okay because these are all serine threonine sites. And then really good coverage with the multi-pathway reagent, including some of the critical regulators like 2448. A couple more examples here. ZAP70. So we see one site on ZAP70 with the IMAC. We see a number of sites with both phosphotyrosine and the multipathway, including some of those most important sites like tyrosine 319 or tyrosine 493. Same story with P38. We can see one peptide with IMAC, but we're only getting the duly phosphorylated activation loop sites on P38 with PY or with multipathway enrichment. So again, this really points to how critical it is to think about how you're going to enrich your samples to really get complete coverage of the pathway you're interested in. Now, how about quantitatively? So this is a very busy slide, but these are just some log two ratio plots. So each point on here represents a different phosphopeptide. On the y-axis, as we go up, those phosphopeptides get more intense. And then things to the left go down with the anti-CD3 treatment. Things to the right go up. So again, just in terms of sheer number, we can see IMAC has the most, right? 16,000 peptides quantified, 1,700 of those go down, 2,500 go up, a huge data set. But you'll notice there are also a number of things that are going down or going up quantitatively from the PY data and the multi-pathway data. And we know that some of these things are really the critical regulators that we might be most interested in as we assay these samples. So we validated some of this data with some Western blots. So we can look at ZAP70 phosphorylated at tyrosine 319. In the mass spec data, it went up about twofold. And that correlates nicely with the Western blot. We see a modest increase in phosphorylation of ZAP70. PLC gamma, we can look at tyrosine 783. That went up almost 20-fold in the mass spec data. And again, correlates really nicely with what we get by Western blot. AKT, serine 473. This one didn't change in the mass spec data, but again, that correlates with the Western blot, and this has to do with, with uh, P10 status in jerkets. 
And then finally, ERK duly phosphorylated at those activation loop sites. This went up about 32-fold in the mass spec data. And in the Western, we go from not being able to see signal to seeing signal. So really nice correlation and really nice validation of the mass spec data using these Western blots. So, you know, a question we get a lot when we do the services is we'll deliver the data, people will be all excited and say, all right, we got thousands of things, hundreds of things change. What do we do now? And these kind of Western validations are really great and really powerful tools for validating the overall quality of the data set. But we also have a mass spec-based approach to validate this data and look at even more samples for endpoints that you've found in some of these initial discovery approaches. And that's to do targeted assays. So here again, we take our proteins, we cut to peptides, but now since we know exactly what peptides we want to look for, those things that showed up as interesting in some of those early discovery experiments, we'll actually make and spike in heavy isotope labeled synthetic peptides. We then take that mix of endogenous peptides and synthetic peptides, enrich it with an antibody or set of antibodies, and then run mass spec. And we tell the mass spec to look just for these things that we've targeted, just these things that we've spiked in peptides for. And because we're doing that, you actually get really nice gain in sensitivity in these methods relative to just a basic discovery approach. So we validated actually 10 different assays uh, for antibodies where we use a lot in Western blot. So things like AKT, CDC2, STATs, ERCs. We showed a couple different things here. One, these assays have tremendous linearity. So here we're linear over four to five orders of magnitude dynamic range, right? So that's a, that's a tremendous amount of linear range to be working it with and large fold changes that you can accurately quantitate using this method. The other thing that we did was reproducibility. So here we took the same samples and just processed them independently on five different days, right? And in doing that, we see that the reproducibility of these assays is really great. Again, because you're spiking in synthetic peptide standards. So this tells you if you have a lot of samples to do and you need to run those over the course of days, weeks, or months, you're going to be able to do that and get really nice reproducible data each time. So again, we validate this data using that same JERCAT system, untreated or treated with the anti-CD3 antibody. And the bar chart here shows the mass spec data. The westerns are shown above each bar. And again, we can see really nice correlation between what we get out of the mass spec assay, now a targeted mass spec assay, and what we get in Western blot. So just to kind of wrap it all up, you know, our, our methods kind of span the whole range of discovery from really early work where maybe you don't know the targets and you don't understand the biology yet. You want to just assay a few samples and try and figure out some of the biology all the way to we understand the biology now, we know what targets are important, and now we want to assay those targets across a lot of different samples. Right, so the discovery work is great for those early kind of experiments. Doing the motif antibody enrichments, doing the IMAC enrichment, or as I mentioned at the outset, doing total proteomics and looking for protein level changes. The pathway-based enrichments fall kind of somewhere in the middle, where now we're not quite to targeted, but we do have a fixed list of candidates that we're going to look for in each sample. And finally, we have the targeted assays, where now we really know what we want to look for. We're going to go in, and we're going to look for all of those endpoints, and we can multiplex these up to about 100 endpoints and look for that across a lot of samples. So really what this allows, this, this building up of this toolbox, it allows you to choose the tools that really best fit your project and actually where your project is at at a given point in time. So that's my part, and with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Chris to tell you a little bit about PhosphoFlow. But again, thank you all for coming.